So thank you all for joining. This is the fourth uh, edition of the NLP Breakfast. And today we are going to talk about graph uh, neural networks. We have a presentation inspired uh, heavily from the network representation learning group um, of Stanford, uh, which mentions, among other references, uh, the gated graph sequence neural network paper and the node to rec paper. Uh, the, la the last one, which is from Stanford, actually. Um, and so before introducing graph neural network, uh, I'll, I'll introduce a bit the context, uh, what we're trying to achieve, and, um, and what we need to define when we, when we do graph neural networks. You'll see it's very tied to defining this, uh, a certain similarity over which to optimize on the graph. So the motivation for this paper, uh, for this presentation is that, um, so in natural language processing, uh, graphs appear a lot in semantics, uh, just like you can see on this picture. Uh, so here you have a uh, relation between entities, oops, sorry, um, that are linked so through, through edges. And, um, there is also this big Wikidata project that aims at uh, creating a huge graph of all these entities. Uh, and it's a, it's a very challenging problem to try to uh, embed all of these uh, entities because it's a very large graph uh, that is constantly changing. Um, and why is it interesting? It's, it's for instance, uh, today a user in Fiddly might be interested in filtering articles that talk about a certain entity. Um, but this might be a, a too narrow a filter. And so we might be interested in suggesting neighboring entities uh, for, for this user, which are not necessarily directly given by the Wikidata graph structure, because the Wikidata graph structure is essentially uh, uh, built in a bottom-up fas fashion uh, with links that go from the bottom to the top. Uh, and in in more general uh, in a more general way, it's uh, embeddings are always better representations to work with, um, and so we we like to try to have low dimensional representation of all of these items to perform downstream tasks such as clustering or classification. There was also very recently the released by Facebook of PyTorch Bygraph, which is a very a nice uh, open source project uh, that solves, that aims to solve these big, uh, big graphs uh, problems. So our goal is to provide an embedding for the original nodes of our graph in a new Euclidean space. Um, and what we're actually aim to achieve is to uh, preserve the, sim the original similarity in this network in our, uh, in our new embedding space. Uh, and so what we not only need to define is the function that will encode our nodes to the target space, but also the similarity that we actually want to optimize over. And so once we've defined uh, an encoder, uh, a class of encoder function, uh, and a similarity function that we want to, to achieve uh, and to imitate, uh, the, the thing that we have to do is to optimize the parameters of the encoders so that we learn representations of, of all of these nodes. Uh, here are the three parameters of the model that would imitate this fixed function of similarity which is a pairwise function over all the nodes. And so the first method that uh, aimed at uh, dealing with this problem um, were dubbed shallow encoding. And the principle is to look at it just like a, an embedding lookup matrix. Uh, so you would have the result, all the parameters of your learning would be uh, in this matrix Z, and every node would be would correspond to a certain column of the matrix, and all of these would be the, the features 
of all the nodes. And so the encoder formula would actually write Z times a, a one out encoded vector, which is the, just the indicator vector corresponding to the, oops, sorry, corresponding to the index of your node in the graph. So the number, total number of parameters that we are learning is uh, the number of dimensions that we want in our final space times the number of nodes in the graph. So now the, the question is, what is node similarity? What is this node similarity function that we want to approximate? Um, and for instance, should we, should we consider that two nodes uh, should have similar embeddings if they are directly connected uh, or if they share neighbors or if they have a similar structural roles. And you see already that the difference between these three points is the level, the, the order level of relationship that you have. The first one is a really low level relationship whereas the third one is a really more ab abstract and complex relationship and similarity uh, definition. So we're going to talk about three of these similarities, uh, HSNC, multi-hop, and, and the random walk approaches. So the first main way of uh, defining similarity in a graph is just the, the, the entries of your similarity matrix would be for any, any uh, pair of nodes U and V the edge weight between these two nodes. And so the intuition is that you'd like to approximate this similarity matrix with the embeddings of both of your nodes. And so you're going to minimize the uh, minimum squared error between this, this target fixed similarity matrix objective and these uh, three parameters uh, that represent all the nodes your graph. Now to go beyond this, this issue of, uh, of only considering low order similarity between nodes in the graph, uh, there is that multi-hop similarity, uh, uh, that multi-hop similarity in the graph which consider different uh, uh, levels of, uh, of relationship between nodes which basically uh, takes different powers of your adjacency matrix, uh, which, which embed different, uh, different order of uh, relationship. And so to illustrate that, uh, here is a very simple graph where you can see the adjacency matrix of order one uh, gives an edge weight of one for the relationship between A and B and A and C. And when you elevate this matrix to the power two, you see the second order relationship between nodes is, uh, is zero for these same nodes. So A and B have, have a zero weight uh, second order relationship. But then now A and C, A and D, sorry, are connected and B and C are also connected. And so the idea is now that you will optimize your uh, three parameters here to imitate uh, this elevated uh, adjacency matrix. Um, and you can do that actually for uh, any number of, uh, of any power of this matrix and then concatenate the embeddings so that you will assemble both the low order similarity and the higher order similarity. And to generalize that, we can actually uh, Note that we we could do that for any node similarity uh, measure over the graph, and so if you're familiar with uh, uh, the Jacquard similarity or the Adamic Adar similarity, this can be a much more uh, complex uh, defined similarities in the graph that takes into account the number of shared neighbors over the number of uh, uh, simple non-shared neighbors. Um, so these are just different similarities that you could potentially optimize on. But so for the first two similarities that we've seen so far, the HSNC and, and multi-hop, um, the problem is that we have here to optimize over the square number of all nodes, uh, which is problematic for large graphs. Um, 
and also these kind of seem to be handcrafted similarities somehow that we have to define and it seems really dependent on, on the choice that you will make for these. And so that's where node to vec aim uh, is very uh, a very seducing solution to this uh, because it aims at solving solving both of these problems at once uh, by using uh, random walks. Um, and so the idea of random walks is that you're going to take a graph and walk uh, from node to another, uh, given a certain strategy of of walking across the graph. And the co-occurrence event that you observe, uh, you're going to assume you're going to try to maximize the likelihood of these events. Uh, that's, the, that's the usual maximum likelihood approach where you have a certain uh, low that you want to learn, uh, probabilistic low that you want to learn, and you draw events of this low, and you want to optimize your, the parameters of your model to to actually imitate this law. Uh, and so the way it works is you're going to achieve at uh, optimizing these embeddings so that the probability of co-occurrence of uh, two nodes across these random walks is proportional to, to, to the dot product of these embeddings. The advantage of that is that has uh, more expressivity than the similarities we've talked about before. It both captures local and higher order neighborhood information because when you travel randomly through the graph, you can both stay really close in the neighborhood as well as travel through nodes that are far away. And it's also very efficient because you would optimize only on co-occurring pairs and you wouldn't have to have this squared number of nodes to optimize over. So to detail this uh, a bit more, uh, this is the, the function that we try to optimize. So we sum over all the nodes of our graph. We take uh, all the nodes that we've seen in random walks starting from uh, the node u. Um, and there can be actually duplicates in, in this sum because you can go over the graph and go back to nodes that you've previous curiously explored. And this is the probability of co-occurrence that we try to maximize, uh, which we usually parameterize by a soft max, hence this uh, expression here. And you, you see that there is, we thought we solved the problem here but we actually end up also with a uh, here a sum a normalization factor uh, that theoretically we'd have to take over all the nodes of our graph, which which would uh, make our effort uh, vain. And so there's a trick, a probabilistic trick to that, uh, which approximates this sum. Uh, if you take a random distribution over all the nodes, you can approximate this term. By, uh, by, this, by this new formula, where here you have a certain number of, of random samples of, of the nodes that you haven't actually uh, traveled through. Uh, so U and V are uh, co-occurring nodes that you want to maximize the probability of, and these are random negative samples uh, that you haven't observed. Uh, and in practice, what works good is actually to make this uh, probability distribution a little biased towards node with a higher degree in the graph. Uh, and so node to vec comes in with an additional trick to even more enforce the, the way of uh, having this local and higher order neighborhood information. Because so far we haven't really talked about how we travel through the graph. How do we make these random walks? And the naive way of doing that is to say, we'll travel uh, between edges and between nodes by taking the, the weight of the edges as a probability, as an unnormalized probability. 
Um, but actually, in practice, uh, they found that it works better to uh, uh, kind of bias these walks across the graph into walks that will stay more in the neighborhood and they resemble uh, thread first search uh, graph traveling uh, combined with uh, walks that will be more enticed into traveling far away from the initial node which imitate uh, dev first searches. Um, and so in all of these approaches that we've seen so far there are some limitations. Uh, first of all, it is tr transductive. It, it, there are transductive uh, algorithms by opposition of inductive, which means that if you ever have a new node in your graph, you have to redo the whole computation to get the, the new embedding. Um, also, there is no taking into account of any potential node features. Um, and if you have a graph of users, you might want to take uh, the user's individual features into account also in the final embeddings that you're generating and not only the graph relationships. And the final thing is that there uh, isn't any parameter sharing when learning this, uh, these new embeddings, uh, which is what we generally aim at to avoid problems such as load peering. Uh, and so that's where graph neural networks come in. Uh, as a seducing approach to this problem uh, in which you would take an, an initial input graph and you would say that the embedding that you are going to generate from every node comes from a, an outward flow from all the neighboring nodes of the graph. And so you see here that to generate the second layer embedding of node A I would have to have the first layer embedding of the node D, C, and B, which themselves are issued from the, the zero order embedding of these previous nodes, which I'm going to detail a bit in a few slides. So the idea is that the, the first layer, uh, what we call the first layer, are the actual inputs of your nodes. So if you don't have any features in your nodes, you can just take the one dot encoded vector corresponding to this, the index of this node. But if you have users, or if you want to embed anything else that's only node relative, you could put it uh, here as an input feature. And so then you're gonna travel to the neighbors of this node to generate the layer at time t plus one, and so on and so forth. And you see that with this approach, first of all, we're using the, the features of the nodes, which we didn't have before. And also we can have theoretically an arbitrary depth of network. Um, and so I wanted first to, to make the comparison with the continuous bag of words algorithms, for instance. Uh, because to me, the, this uh, representation reminded me a lot of this. But actually, it's very, what's a bit misleading is in this picture is that the, we don't have a, an, an auto encoder. We simply have an encoder. Um, whereas here, what we, what we try to do is to find back the original one not encoded vector of what's in the middle. So continuous bag of word, if you remember the algorithm, is that you take windows across, that travel across all your text, and you try to predict the middle word given the surrounding words. But what's interesting in this SIBO continuous bag of word algorithm is the what happens here. These are the embeddings that you're trained. Whether, uh, whereas here, what we are interested in is really the final layer of our model. And so what we have to do to perform these uh, embeddings is to have at each step uh, an aggregation function. And then we can use a neural network to transform this aggregated information and give it more expressive power. So to sum it up in terms of uh, math formula, uh, 
the initial states are your features. Uh, if you want to compute the states of the same nodes at uh, a layer K, you will have to take the previous layer embedding to add all the previous layers uh, embedding of your neighbors and to combine it through a nonlinearity function. And so the parameters that you will learn at each layer uh, are these two matrices. Now, just to uh, have a quick, uh, uh, to, to do a quick representation of what's actually going on. So first, in this, in this example of graph, I want to compute the embeddings of, uh, the embedding of A in, in the first layer. I will need to have the features of both of these uh, neighbors, of all of these neighbors and the features of A. And so these are the first matrices of parameter I'll learn. Then if I want, then I would do the same for all of the, of the nodes of the graph. And if I want to go at the second layer, so, and note already that, uh, for instance, the, the, the node information from E and F will be present in this first layer embedding of the node C, because he's an immediate neighbor of these two nodes. And so whenever you want to the second uh, layer uh, embedding of the node A, you will have this new formula that takes, first of all, the previous states and inputs it here, and takes also all this information here, which, as we said, contain like more high order relationship uh, information, and so on and so forth. What's interesting also about this, uh, this method is that we, we have shared parameters, which we didn't have before, uh, across all the layers uh, of, the, of the model. Uh, and we have an inductive capability, which is that if we train, if we train a network only uh, on, a, on a given graph, then when a new node arrives, we can just as we've seen before with the with our train network, we can make the information flow from all these features node and have your, our new generated embedding. And we don't need to retrain anything. And it's true for this, but it's actually true for, even if you want to generalize to a completely new graph, uh, this also works. And it has very interesting application if you uh, are working in biology uh, when proteins uh, when the graph proteins interaction uh, have to be uh, sort of uh, embedded and factorized this is a good way to uh, to to generate these embeddings um, and so now we we're going going to talk about like variants of these graph uh, neural networks strategies and the first one is what they call graph convolutional networks. Uh, and the idea is uh, simply to say that these are two parameters, these are two sets of parameters that we are going to merge in only one new set of parameter. And we are going to aggregate together both the neighbors of the nodes that we want to embed, but also the, the node itself uh, in the previous layer states. And additionally to that, we will do a new, uh, a new normalization, which is related to the node. Uh, and so if we take our, our previous formula description, it means that at each layer, we're going to factorize all of these parameters into a new matrix, which reduce the number of parameters and probably reduce overfitting. Uh, and so the aggregation function becomes now weighted by the number of edges uh, that, you, that you have so that nodes with, uh, lower, uh, with a lower number of edges are actually, have actually more importance in giving you the final uh, feature. And so the last uh, variant that I want to talk about is our gated graph neural networks, which take that factorization to 
uh, again, a better level of, of factorization. Uh, but the challenge, the challenge, if we wanted to do actually deep graph neural networks embedding would be same as before, overfitting with too many parameters. And, and, uh, and, and there would be the problems of training uh, of vanishing gradients going in. So the idea here is to say that actually we're going to, at all layers, uh, merge all of these matrices in a way all of these matrices of parameters are going to be the same and they're going to be trained simultaneously um, and so that's why they use um, long short-term memory cells uh, so recurrent neural networks to embed uh, these nodes at the different layers so you see here each time we will have the same uh, uh, set of parameters that we train on. And so that further factorizes the number of parameters of the model. So that's it for this presentation. If you want to have a, a better insight of why graph networks are so powerful, uh, there is a good reference here. Um, but also what's very interesting about all of this problem are the optimization challenges, because we didn't talk about the fact that when you want to optimize this on a GPU, you don't necessarily have the same number of neighbors for all the nodes in the graph. So in order to do that, I think they have like some uh, neighboring subsampling trick where you actually optimize by sampling a few of the neighbors. Uh, and uh, there are plenty of very interesting uh, linked uh, uh, subjects about uh, for example, subgraph embeddings. So that's it for the presentation. Thank you for listening. And if you have any question. So a big thanks to uh, the <laughs> the Stanford teacher that made these awesome slides, most of them are inspired from this uh, really good resource. Um, yeah. In terms of computational power, the neural network solution, the last one, how, how does it compare with some of the, the previous models? So that's a really good question. So actually, I don't know if I can actually try it fast enough. Uh, actually, the, the, the original algorithms that we've seen also were working with uh, optimization based on uh, sto stochastic gradient descent, which is the same optimization that, uh, that neural networks benefit from. Gosh, sorry. Check, uh, check, check. I'm just trying to find. So when we optimize this kind of, of function, in general, we use uh, stochastic gradient descent algorithms. That does, that's the same process that's working with uh, uh, neural networks. Uh, but the fact is that you can apply this same trick of uh, only subsampling a few of the nodes for the training. Uh, so in terms of performance, uh, I'd say that uh, the performance of training the graph neural network is uh, equivalent to the random walk, uh, the node to vec approach, uh, I think. And how do you use it from Eclipse compared to something like Rubrex? Are mm. the neural networks embedded methods really much better than? Yeah. Uh, so the the fact, and the, this is, I didn't talk much about that, and I don't uh, know uh, exactly about it. But uh, it's true that the what we're trying to optimize is the similarity. But what we're actually interested in is what do we do with these embeddings, and so I think they have like a classification paths on which they compare which methods work better, uh, and so yeah.
that's that's how they compare it. Okay. 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 So thank you all for uh, joining and listening. Uh, thank you, Eddie. Thank you very much.